Right, sweet. We're on. So, episode 12, we've got Lapo, Jason Lappin from Zoo Fitness, businessman, ex fighter, <laughs> coach, mentor, jack of all trades, really. Um, so, yeah, we bumped into you, or maybe at Zoo Fitness, I think, the first time, or at the physio. Yeah, that's at physio, same physio. physio. That's right. <laughs> Hi, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'll let you do the introduction, actually, Lapo. Oh, okay. Give us a bit of a rundown, brother. All right, where do we take it? How far back do you want it? As far back as you can remember. <laughs> I've got a well, few. Well, let's start. You're obviously in the fitness industry, Zoo yep. Fitness. Like, have you always been interested in that? How'd you get into the fight game? Yeah, okay. All right. All right. Well, I suppose we're taking it way back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Man, I was always that kid that was into, into fitness. You know, none of my family were into fitness at all. Uh, so I was a kid that played footy and always out on his bike and skateboard and carrying on and stuff. And then, <clears throat> then uh, you know, uh, yeah, life uh, it throws a few curveballs at you. But for for some reason, I managed to stay on the path. You know, and it was quite easy to hop off. But um, no, I stayed on the path, and uh, yeah, I just somehow made it my life. Um, how did I get into fighting? Like, yeah, so it was sort of always an interest in martial arts, you know. I grew up as a kid as Bruce Lee movies, you know. Um, used to go to my dad's every second weekend and stuff, so he was a Bruce Lee and Cowboy and Western fan. So we used to watch them together sort of thing and the whole Jean-Claude Van Damme come in and uh, it was, you know, kickboxer and blood sport and stuff and we just grew up on it, you know. And... Uh, yeah, I never really took it seriously. Went to a few different classes, you know, like Fitness World used to be down here on Oxley. Oh, yeah. They had the old uh, Taekwondo. Back in the day. Yeah, that's what I said. How far you want to take it back? <laughs> it was your birthday the other day, wasn't it? Mate, 47, uh, 47. yesterday. Yeah, the, um, Sunday. Happy yeah. birthday. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Didn't think I'd make it, that's for sure, <laughs> this far. But, uh, but yeah, um, I was, yeah, martial arts was just really interesting, you know, like I'm, I boxed for a little bit down at PCYC as a younger, you know, 14, 15 year old. I had a couple of cousins down there that <clears throat> did really well. But um, for me, um, I was never really gifted, you know, I could work hard, you know, and I was a whole my own, but I wasn't great at it. So anyway, I used to muck around a little bit of that sort of stuff. But then, uh, yeah, I had a, a baby early. I had... Uh, um, How old were you? I was 21, you know, and it was quite confronting, you know, because I knew that me and that girl were never going to last, but then I tried to be a man, you know, and do the right thing and buy the house at Glenmore Park and, you know, be working. I knew it was always destined to fail. It was, um, but, you know, she's, uh, I'm a grandfather now to her, so, you know, life's good in that part. Uh, You know, wouldn't have changed any of that. But I got a fo- I remember seeing a photo at the Pean Hospital and I had her in my arms and I just looked like the Michelin man. <laughs> and I remember going, dude, do something about it. But cuz then Were it you was fighting then? Were no, you at- no. Okay. I was um interested and stuff, but it was just work, work, work because I had a family all of a sudden I got to provide for, you know, and I was Shit, keep on working. At the time, I was working in the Flemington Markets, you know, and uh, just working and grinding, you know, sometimes 80 hours a week and big hours and just tired. So I was either asleep or in a half days because you're waking up at 1, 2 o'clock in the morning and go to work. Um, anyway, I had, I had Shay and, uh, yeah, I just seen that photo and went, man, what are you going to do? And then I said, oh, it's like, I don't know, gyms back then weren't, like, you couldn't, you didn't have your choice. You know, you had Fitness World. Or we had... Uh, the squash centre at uh, Preston Street. The squash centre. Yeah, they had some few weights down the back of the squash court. Think right? of the past, the squash centres now. They're oh, all gone, I think. I know, I know. Yeah, and that's where that's all we really had in Penrith. You know, I think Kevin Chevelle had his thing, but, you know, plus I had no much spare money either. You know, it was expensive to go to the gym. so And not wasting any money. Kid on the way type thing, you know. So anyway, I, I did a, a few, trained a little bit with uh, Steve Skibbers and Malcolm Henning, two local guys that, uh, you know, kickboxers. Just kind of fell in love with kickboxing and then they closed down. So they were up at Kingswood uh, Park Avenue, whatever it is, or Cox Avenue, sorry. And then they closed down and uh, lost the gym. So it's like, oh, shit, what do I do? I did nothing for a bit, and, but I was pretty on the urge of fighting. Like, he had a really good fight team there. They... Um, Glenn Barragri and uh, Mal Henning himself, uh, Steve and Lachlan Stewart and all these old heads from uh, Todd Devaney, all these old heads from Penrith 
and I used to look up to him. I was a little bit younger still. I was still young, you know, 21. And um, anyway, they left and and sort of we all broke away. Um, a few of them kept on fighting. So then one day my mate said, oh, I'll come to this gym at Blacktown. I'm like, oh, okay. So I went to this called Fight Right. And then uh, straight away he's like, oh, you're, you're right. You've done some stuff, blah, blah, blah. So he took me under his wing and I had uh, about 20 or so fights under him. And uh, yeah, we learnt together. What was the record? Yeah, I'm pretty. I'm pretty. I'm not that good. I'm <laughs> 11, and I'm just 10. I won one no contest. The guy kept on kicking me in the nuts, and he and they canned it. Um, one, yeah, 11 and 21, uh, 20, 10, 10 and 11. So yeah, but we didn't know anything about fighting. You know, my, I'll go into that gym now, and he makes everyone stop and bow to me. He goes, "Without this guy, I'd be nothing." You know, yeah, I remember him just putting his mouth guard in and go, "Okay, go." It was like, <laughs> oh. but it was really, really strange. Like, we'd get there, and I would sit around the 70, 70 to sixty-seven kilos fight at sixty-three. Um, and then we get there, and it's like, "Oh, your opponent pulled out." It was really dodgy, like back then. It's like, "Okay, you can fight this guy. He's only five kilos heavier." Oh, he's at 72, but I was meant to fight 60. And by the time you hop in the ring, it's 10 kilos difference, and it just gets pummeled, you know? And I did. I got pummeled. But I just I look back, at it, look back on it now, and it really made me um, resilient and determined to win. Like, I had four losses straight up. One, this was how dodgy it was. I still remember my first fight. It was at the above a Blacktown ice skating ring. You used to have a, oh, yeah. used to have a gym up there, right? Anyway, so we're in there. His name was Josh Pierce, Jason Lappin. So we didn't wait, and I thought I won. You know, I was like pretty comfortable. I thought, yeah, oh, I won the fight. And uh, they go, oh, the winner in the, say I was in the blue corner and he was in the red corner. The winner is in the blue corner, Jason Pierce. And the ref goes, and put the other guy's hand up. And I went, oh, shit, it's done now. And once it's done, it's done. It was just so, I still got it on videotape that him saying Jason Pierce, his, his name's Josh Pierce, Jason Lappin, and it was in my corner too. <laughs> so they, anyway, they didn't give it to me. They didn't give it to me and then I lost a few. And then, yeah, I had a little bit of a win streak, about six in a row where I captured a few titles and stuff. I really, we, we learned, you know, you don't take a fight with five kilos difference and, you know, uh, you know, back then there was twenty. Uh, wasn't twenty four hour weigh ins too. So you were fighting at the weight you walked around at. So we had to weigh in uh, on the day, like at twelve o'clock, and then come and fight. So you know that night there was no going home refueling, fueling and stuff. You know. So yeah. is that like you mentioned there, like your resilience and that you you built was what? What did you take away most from that? Like fighting there. It's not just a physical thing. Like it sounds like that sort of built you. Like you're only young. Yeah. You do a bit of like you said. I guess you know to be a man type thing at that yeah. type of age. Is that what you learnt most out of that? Looking back. Um. Like I'd, not just I'd the already learned. I'd, I'd learnt that. Yeah. I'd learnt that already. You know, Penrith was a tough town. Um, as a kid, I don't have. Uh, you know, I'm just a housing commission kid from up here. I live. I'm a couple of streets away. It's where I grew up. It was a tough time. Um. You know, mum was an alcoholic. I went to see my mum at House With No Steps and St John of God and all sorts of stuff. My sister used to look after us, me and my brother, and my sister was in a car accident in, when, when she was 14 and passed away on Castle Ray Road. So I cold shivers now. And, uh, yeah, so it started way back then, but we had no one to look after us, you know, and she looked after us. And you say at 14 years old and she was with a boyfriend in the car. So it's just Jesus. wow. But he used to live with us and stuff as well. And so it's always been survival and I always thought that she's always looked after me. She always looked after me and my brother, uh, both younger, and my brother's four years older. And she was another year older than my brother. So she's always looked after us and I don't want to be <laughs> do and go through who deep, but yeah, she's been she never let me fail. Yeah. You know, and I do believe that. And that but I learnt to be resilient then you know um how old were you then uh i was 10 years old so yeah He's but she was one age, that would yeah. yeah she would take me to footy she'd buy my footy boots um they would take me to training um you know uh all this sort of stuff but yeah it was you learn to survive like penrith was really hard like if i the memories i have of that time a period in penrith you know sticks you know um 
the, the the fights, you know, the Simpsons, I don't know if you know those guys, the Pittmans, the Aboriginal side of the Penrith people. And it was just, they were all our friends, but that was our crew that we knocked around with, you know, and it wasn't a good crew. And, uh, yeah, so I think Penrith taught you that back then, you know, and this is before your memory. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't you remember know, none of that. Yeah, yeah, it was a real tough t- town, man. You know, I can remember Dirt Road at the front of... Um, the roundabout, they had an old roundabout at the front of the station. That was a dirt park, just gravel, you know. So I remember going, doing a donut in a car around <laughs> it. Not me, but I was in the back of a car, you know. So, yeah, I think I learnt that, you know, and I learnt that um, that uh, I'd already lost the most precious thing to me ever at 10 years old. So I'm not scared of losing and I'm not scared of dying, Um and I think that's what makes you who you are, you know? So a loss to me is nothing but a learn. Yeah, well, those fights, don't, taking a loss there doesn't mean shit, really, from nah. what you just said. Like, no, nah, That's nah. just water off a dog's back. Survival, man. And then we just, for the next six years, was total survival. Um, my mum kicked me out at 16. Um, not because I was a bad kid or anything, but my father stopped paying maintenance back then at 16. So my birthday was the 19th of July, and she kicked me out on the 20th. Where'd you go? Couch surf for a few mates' houses for a little bit, and then my old man had a fruit shop in Nowra, and he took me. So I stayed down there for about a year, and then I just yeah, I missed my mates and stuff, and so I ended up coming back here, back to Penrith, and yeah, working at the markets. That's where the markets come from, and then that's when I found a girl, and you know, into the fight game, into the, the fight, and that's where it started. But I, I never, I, like I said, I've lost the, the thing that's most dear to me in my whole life, and that's I'm not scared of losing. So I think that, and I do think that she always looks after me. So, yeah, yeah it's a bit weird. It's a bit sad story, but uh, that's how Penrith was, man. It was a tough place, you know, a tough place. You know you're wrong. You didn't step out of line. You knew you don't touch that guy. That guy here, that guy's a rebel. His dad's a bandito. You know, like there was, <laughs> there was a, a line of this hierarchy sort of thing, you know, and, you know, it was just tough, you know. It was a tough, like, I'll, I'll come back into my house and, and you know, drugs and seeing kids sniffing glue and yeah. you know and I never did any of that you know but uh, it was in my house that's for sure what what why didn't you like that's an easy path to go down like the vi- environment and why didn't you think you did that uh I don't know I don't know I was just different. did you feel like you were different like, yeah. yeah I knew I was different I knew I was different I, I wasn't a kid you know like they were you know Christmas presents I want a push bike or a skateboard or yeah. you know like you know, some running shorts. I remember getting running shorts for Christmas once, you know, that's all I wanted. Um, yeah, stuff like that. I knew I was different, you know, I was different, so. And then we obviously were touching your business side. Like yep. You're pretty resilient there as well. How, so after you're in the, in the well, doing your, in your, in your mumbling again, um, <laughs> doing your fights. Yes. Um, where was the transition into... Uh, like sort of coach, training, okay. mentor type thing there. Like, yeah. were you still working at the fruit markets then? Yeah. Or have you... Because what was your first business? Was it Jab Out? Were you there? No, was that no. First I'll, go, no, it's not. That was way it's before then? No, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll give you a quick rundown on that. So was fighting, competing, and it was around about 2000 that I retired. Yeah. I, I think I had my last fight in 2000. So been a long time retired. Um, and then I was training some kids in the garage and then went through a divorce and then I lost that house. So we were just training a couple of friends and stuff. You know, we used to put $2, they used to put $2 in the jar and, uh, you know, we'd buy new Two focus. Bucks, that's yeah, right. used to buy new focus mitts or something, you know, but we all used to run together and stuff. You know, it was not like a fight team or anything like that. And then, uh, yeah, went through all that. Um, and then, you know, at the markets, my mate was training at, it's called Parkside Fitness. It used to be above the scrapbooking places there now on York Road, across from the netball courts. Oh, yeah. So, mate, I'll come down here, we'll come down this gym. And, you know, there just was a gym and there were some fighters. And that's when I first met Tummer and Jamie. They were at the gym and a couple of other friends, you know, Mick Sini and those guys that used to fight. So, anyway, this, uh, the guy that was, was leaving the gym, and he's like, he didn't want to pack up all the stuff. He's going to England to live for 12 months. Dave, uh, I forget his name, someone will remember. But Dave, yeah. Anyway, and he said, oh, I was selling the gym, so I said, oh, I will buy it. So we That was your first gym? First gym yeah, okay. was, yeah, Parkside Fitness on York Road. So York, 51 York Road. Actually, now that rings a bell, Jamie was talking about it when he was on the podcast. 
Same I got photos there yeah. and Jamie's like 14 years old. Yeah. Still as big as human as he is. <laughs> but yeah, it was, you know, like Jamie had a couple of fights there as well. And, and I trained Tama for a long time. And, and yeah, that's, uh, that's where it started. And then I was just so young with Elise. I remember. How old were you there? So it would have been only like uh, 23. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So anyway, but this, I'll tell you, this is a really good story because this has been young in business, and this is where you get caught out. So I took over the whole thing, and we we're talking to the real estate. Yes, oh, you got to redo your lease, redo your lease, redo your lease, and then we're getting a bag, and I'm paying the four hundred or five hundred dollars a week rent or whatever, paying it all. Anyway, they would ring up a couple of months later and go, "Oh, we still haven't signed the lease." Oh yeah, no worries, we'll be down next week. Anyway, sure enough, month or two goes past. And they come back and said, oh, notice, you got to get out. I'm oh. like, oh, what? Yeah, yeah you got to go. You're like, I'm like, I was meant to sign a new lease. And like, oh, no, the building's for sale. They didn't want to sign a lease. They knew the business, the building was for sale. I didn't know the building was for sale. And then they would have to pay me out with the lease of the new tenant, you know, because the tenant wanted to come in, the um, owner. So anyway, I lost the lease. Oh, shit, what do I do? Shit. And I had this PT working for us at the time, uh, Milton Caravis, who owns uh, Fit For All. So Fit For All was my business. Um, so I went and opened up Fit For All with him. But we worked about two minutes and realised that we are totally different people <laughs> <laughs> and different ways to... Uh, oh, Fit For All, that's... Um, yeah. That's... That so that was my old business. school, that gym. I, yeah. went, I went there a few years ago. Now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, looks like it's well, been around for a while. It's... Mate, we bought a heap of... Uh, fitness equipment from Kevin Chevelle. When he redid all his stuff and hammer strength, we took all the old gear. Mm-hmm. We took about um, 15, 16 machines and then we paid 500 bucks a, t- a machine. And, it's like, and I like those a- gyms. It's got like that real old school feel to it. You go in oh, there, it's like... Yeah. Reminds me of like a Rocky movie or something. Yeah, they could film... They'll film some stuff in there for sure in the, in the coming <laughs> coming years. It's got some old so stuff. So how long were you at Fit for All for? Oh, mate, so we were there for, like I said, about five minutes before I realised that we just had different views. And is that just say use with button heads and that was yeah, done without getting yeah. into too much detail? Yeah, oh, no, it, it's it's common knowledge. Yeah, yeah. but um, yeah, we just just had different views on business, man. Yeah. And then I realised, and he realised. So okay, you buy me out, I buy you out. And he didn't want to sell, and I'm like, okay, you want to sell? So it took me about six months to get my money, got paid out, but my contract was stay there for the next five years. So, me stupid, but I just didn't want nothing to do with him. But I had to just lease space there. So I had to leave space and it lasted about four years and I left and he was threatening to take me to court and all sorts of stuff. I'm like, dude, take it. But I went to jab out. That was... So jab out. So that was when jab out was was sprung. Yeah, I was still fighting under jab out there. Um, All the crew, that's where Tumber and that were. Um, John Pedro and, you know, Tyson was a kid and all those people. I had a heap of... Kathy Smith's brother, Paul Smith. Three times Australian champion. Great kid. Talent, super, super talent as a kid. Um, anyway, those types of be Jason Sherry. I had a really good team. Anyway, so we just left and, and um, got up and, and moved. And Jab Out was it for forever, you know. Um, it was, I was uh, in this Muay Thai world where, oh, like, don't even talk to me if you're not talking Muay Thai. And I was so encapsulated in the whole business of it. You know, I had a contract with Foxtel for promoting four or five shows a year out of Panthers and um, supplying fighters all around the country. They you know, fought on some of the biggest... And around the world, we end up fighting... I had to, boys to K1 and boys to uh, shoot boxing and the KO World Series and uh, Las Vegas, uh, all sorts of stuff that I've taken boys to fought, fight for. And that was a big part of it, but um, it's just really hard work. It's really, really hard work. And the thing is that if you hurt yourself, you just can't ring up seek.com and get someone else to replace a tie boxing <laughs> coach, you know? It's really hard. So I would import these ties and have them live with my house and, you know, the wife would get angry because, uh, you know, she can't walk around without putting a dressing gown, dressing gown on and, you know, things like that. So um, I just knew that I, my body couldn't handle it. And uh, at the same time... I was halfway through jab out doing my thing and I got diagnosed, well, just I woke up one morning and couldn't put my shoes on overnight. Went to bed, woke up, couldn't put my shoes on. Couldn't tell my brain to put my foot in the shoe. It's like, fuck, what's going on? I'm like, yeah, come on. <laughs> Fucking hell, you've done it a million times. And I, had, I lift my leg up and put it in the shoe. I'm like, fuck, fuck. This is, I've got a six o'clock start, first first person at, you know, PT at, at, at jab out. Put it again, other foot. I was like, fuck, what's wrong? I was feeling a bit odd, and then I went to go downstairs, and I collapsed downstairs. I was like, oh, 
I rang, I yelled out to Trace, Trace, I've got to go, I've got to go to the hospital, something's wrong. And she's saying, I'll call the doctor in the morning. I go, <laughs> I go, no, I need to go to hospital. And I presented myself at hospital and uh, it took a few days, but I got diagnosed with uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome. So, so you, what's I, that? All right, so yeah. one in a million. Yeah. One in a million. Lotto like, ticket. Yeah, lotto ticket, my, my deathbed bed moment. Um, so your own immune system attacks your central nervous system. Oh, cell. okay. Yeah, I've heard so, of that before. Yeah. What's it? So How do you pronounce it again? Guillain-Barre syndrome. Guillain-Barre. Yeah. And uh, so your optical, in any nerve in your body, it thinks this is your, like you could have had a cold or you could have had a flu or diarrhea. So immune system attacks that, whatever, dessert, whatever virus it is, then it keeps going and attacks your nerve cells. So slowly you die. You can't breathe and... So, all sorts of stuff. But I was fit and healthy. Um, I had uh, ran and rode a heap and still keeping myself busy. Um, and, and yeah, so I, uh, a doctor diagnosed it, sent for a lumbar punch, left too much protein in the spine. And uh, so I was on a plasma product for six, year, uh, six days. Uh, uh, yeah, I ended up spending about 20 or 18 days in hospital. Um, couldn't feed myself, couldn't scratch my pants, couldn't, it attacked my optical nerves as well. So therefore, like to look at you now, there would be three of you and I, like, I couldn't look at you, I was like this. My head was spinning and I just was like this on the bed, um, you know, and just, I, I, had, I remember there my mates feeding me, um, you know, because I, I couldn't control the spoon to my mouth. I'd go, ah, you know, I'd go to scratch myself in the head, I'd poke myself in the eye. You know, um, so all your motor skills, just yeah, gone. totally motor skills gone, um, and you slowly die. And you know, so the doctor pulls in Tracy. Tracy's pregnant with Summer, my my third uh, third ch child, and says, um, uh, "You know, uh, we know it gets worse for better. We're going to have to cut his throat and breathe for him. He's going because he's going to stop breathing and stuff. Um, and yeah, he he could die." You know, like there's yeah, there's good death rate on it, and otherwise he's gonna have to learn to walk and talk again and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, just I remember the moment, just so teary and like my wife's pregnant. I'm looking at my wife and they're looking at the doctor and what the f <laughs> what's going on? Like, hang on, I just ran last week 30, 40 k's. I'd 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 ride rode the Oaks track on a mountain bike. You know, I was fit, I was healthy. I don't drink. I would drink and don't smoke and. Anyway, I said, no, 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 what have I done wrong, you know? And um, there was a, there's a life-changing moment. I was on my bed and, my, like, my mates say, I was just grey, you know, just grey. Um, my hair went grey overnight, Nelly. I was just ill, and I dragged myself to the mirror of the bathroom. No one was there. The doctors weren't there. No family. No one was there. Um, and I dragged myself. I looked in the mirror, and I said, all right, I said, all right, let's go. Let's go. Let's do it. If you want to do it, let's do it. Let's go. Let's fucking go. And I looked at myself in the mirror and I fucking said, let's go. You think you can beat me? Let's go. And from that minute and that moment, I got fucking better. They never ended up cutting my throat. They never ended up uh, making my lungs have to breathe. And from that moment, I got better. And I said, okay, let's do it. And I just, it's determination. And the doctors were amazed. I, I had a couple of neurosurgeons and local neurosurgeons all come in and go, like, he's just made his recovery. Da, da, da. And it was the plasma, plasma product as well. So they had, if the plasma exchange didn't work, then it was a full body blood exchange to get all that anybody's, uh, the, the uh, attacking virus out of my system, try to. But it worked as well. So, but I do believe it was, um, you know, some of those people like poor me situation, you know, like if you're, yeah, hundred yeah, percent. The vi yeah. vi sort of victim mentality. Victim, yeah, I, yeah. I, I wasn't victim. I'm like, let's go. No, you know, head yeah, take, attack come it, on. Head on. And um, yeah, from that moment, I, I got, to, I got better. You know. Well, and you it, hear a lot of those stories about people that are in. I don't know if you'd say terminally, terminally ill or just they're real crook and they're yep. like, they're trying everything, and then all of a sudden they click this switch yeah. in the head, yeah. and it's a mentality thing. Yep. Um, like I know, I know. Wim, I'm doing this breathing stuff at the moment, and yeah. Wim Hof always talks about it. Yeah. And he's like, "You can change your whole immune system and biological makeup by the way you think." Yep. Where he, like he always goes into breath. Obviously, he's yep. into that breathing stuff. But 
Yeah, you do hear about that a lot of the time. It's people just go, all right, let's yeah. fucking do it. Like, Mate, bring it on. I'm 100% proof of it. Yeah. I looked in the mirror and I'm telling you, there was emptiness in my eyes. I was dead. I was fucking dying, you know. Still and grey as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that didn't change. Well, I can't, so, I can't yeah. be doing hair jokes, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was a... And then, like, back to... I had jab out at that time, um, you know, and I, I, I just... From that moment, I really got old, I feel. That was my changing. I felt like old. physically? Yeah, you physically. Mean? I mean, I still ran ultra marathons after that sort of stuff, and I've still trained and kept myself fit and healthy. But um, that moment, I, I was looking around for something else to do because I knew I just can't hold these tie pads for fucking six and eight hours a day, boom, 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 getting beat up by these young guys and making them champions and... And that's what you needed to do in that industry. It's a really hard business. If you think PT is hard or something, like to be a tie get boxing coach. Or, yeah, punched, and getting hold of yeah. and kneed and elbowed and, you know, I've been cut holding pads and all sorts of stuff. And then there's, there's always big blokes or, you know, fit, young, young strong guys. Um, so, yeah, I, I was looking for what happened. And we used to buy some our martial arts equipment for like boxing gloves, mouth guards, groin guards and leg pads and stuff from Shogun Martial Arts. So anyway, the old fellow there, old fellow there Alan, will be friends for years because I was just that martial arts scene. And um, he always just say, oh, you ain't going to buy me business, you know. Um, so yeah, then we go, shit, okay, hang on, maybe we can do this, you know. And then, uh, hang on, we're, we're just, you know, we we... Not they don't even own a house, you know. We we're in a mortgage with the bank. Yeah, we maybe owe twenty percent of it, but we've got another twenty years paying off this house and and things. And I was like, shit, what do we do? And then my father-in-law, we asked my father-in-law, would he put his house up for us to get the bank loan, you know? And we had to come up with a business plan with the bank. And anyway, so we went and did that, and uh, we bought Shogun Martial Arts. So that's how I led into that. And then we'll probably we uh, it was. The business was great business. Um, they were very scared of the internet. The, they were old, 70 and whatever. Um, so Shogun Martial Arts is like equipment for yes. basically everything in the martial arts Yeah, industry. from a boxing uh, glove to a kid's karate belt and BJJ and yeah. keys and uh, ninja gear and <laughs> all sorts of stuff, you know. Um, yeah. We had a contract there that we used to supply to all the corrective services and... Um, uh, a federal police and any police and we would fit out their rooms and stuff so yeah we end up doing that and we we put the business online so that was our e-commerce site and then we ended up becoming probably the number one martial arts supplying place in australia so we send out about uh 6800 parcels a year and in that parcel could have 10 or 12 things or one could just have one mouth guard and it was a full e-commerce site four warehouses what year was this Oh well, this was only uh, only um, nine years ago. Oh yeah, it's not nine that years. Long ago. Yeah, okay. so uh, that's the story. Um, and then you know we would ha we'd have two thousand lines that we s we have on in there, and that doesn't include sizes. Like a karate outfit has you know the little kids all the way up to adults. So it was a hard business, but it was a good business. Did you know anything about e-commerce? No. <laughs> <laughs> No, no. But I'm thankful, thankful that my wife is pretty switched on, you know. And uh, I knew that I could sell, or you know, I knew I could sell. You know, I. Where did you pick that selling thing up from? Was that from being all the years a promoter and yeah, and learnt, the, ma the markets, the yeah, markets, like the markets. Yeah, yeah I went you know, like I, I went down there when I was so young, but um, it taught me to be a man, you know, and taught me how to make a dollar, you know. So, so that whole thing and. Then we ended up, yeah, we ended up a really good business. And then, so that's how uh, Zoo Fitness come about because Fitness First used to be one of our customers. So we supply all the boxing bags and freestanding bags and Fitness First. So I had a relationship with them, dealing with them for two or three years. And, you know, they just trust me to just send the invoice and, you know, we did want to change all the boxing bags over at Tarrant Point. They wouldn't even get a quote, second quote. Did Jason go do it? So you did all the fitness first? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is how it started. And then I got a, I get along really Jeez, well. There with, was a lot of them back then too. Mate, there was. We sent stuff to Western Australia yeah. and everything back then. Um, and I got along really well with the area managers and stuff, you know, because I just I made their job easy. They wanted a new boxing rack and, and chain and stuff because they go through them. They just send me to go do it, you know. We'll get it fixed and whatever. Um, so, yeah, that's how it happened. And I was talking to the area manager 
uh, from here. His name's Liam Hammond. And uh, Liam said to me, oh, they're, they're over Penrith. Hey? I'm like, mate, I love Penrith. What are you talking about? So and he goes, he goes oh, no, they're, 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 they're cutting out. They're, you know, Parramatta, Bankstown, Auburn, um, Tarrant Point, they're all going. I'm like, what? No, you guys are going to shut the doors. I'm like, bullshit. Anyway, so we start speaking to them, um, the right people, legal side of, of fitness first. And uh, I, they, I was in a meeting, I go, yeah, well, I'll buy it, you know. And then I was out of my depth, totally. <laughs> and financially, too, to, to it's purchase. It's a big space, too. 3,000 square metres, yeah. man. Um, I was out of my depth. And I don't know why I said it, if I'm a big note myself or something. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we, on the way home, he rang me um, and he goes, mate, are you serious? I'm like, yeah, I'm serious. Next thing you know, uh, mate, we've we'd done a deal. I, all of a sudden, two other buyers come in to play. We had to outbid them. We ended up doing it. And then so I bought the business. We signed the deal with Fitness First. And then our landlord uh, didn't accept us assignment of lease. So... Yeah, not young in business, I suppose, but just don't understand big business. Um, so what happens is that back in the day, say Fitness First had a place that weren't going too well, and they would sign the business over to someone like myself who closes the business, doesn't go well after 12 months, and then they get out of that lease for the next 10 years and they ride someone's name off. It's called ride someone's name off so they get out of the lease. Say they got a lease there for 10 years, but it's not going too well. They want to fold it. So they put some bodgy person in, fold it. Yeah, okay. Get out of the lease for the next nine years. Very smart how they do it. But these people were under them. They, they, they thought that I was just this gopher person yeah, okay. to take the, take the fall. Fitness first, give them some money. <coughs> and I'm saying, no, nah, man, I want to make a go of this, you know. So we ended up in the Supreme Court. Oh, shit, all the way to the top. Mate, they got, they got uh, a Supreme Court injunction in four days. Uh, our landlord said no, they didn't, as, and then Fitness First took them to court. Like in four days, they get a date. He goes, it takes 12 months to get a date in the Supreme Court. They got it in four days. So this is where the money comes in. Yeah. So anyway, before the four days, they call us to a, a mediation with the landlord, um, and we go to this business in the city. We're going up the thing, we pop out this lift, we're looking outside the Harbour Bridge, and Tracy's taking photos. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, shit, and this bloke's saying, hey, you want coffee? <laughs> we go into this room, and then on our behalf, the legal team for Fitness First are there. Tony Dempsey, his name is, and um, Tony just tore shreds off him, you know, uh, about on our behalf. And I'm sitting there going, wow, shit, this is out of our, <laughs> this is out of our league. <laughs> like we just want to open a gym. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and we're out of our league, and I'm like, what the fuck? And anyway, so he just said, I'll never forget it, and I didn't know the terminology and then he said to him, so I had to ask him the terminology at the end of it. He goes, mate, if you don't, if you don't take him as the, if you don't accept this assignment of lease, we'll go dark on it. And I didn't even know what go dark is. What's that mean? So at the end of the meeting, I go, what does go dark mean? <laughs> so they pay, it's cheaper for them to pay the lease, put the boards up, black out the windows and just leave it and run, oh, out, run, run out the lease as a loss for the next nine years. So, but no centre wants that because it makes it sound look shit, right? Yeah. So I'm, that was the moment I watched him go, oh, shit, hang on. We're not stuffing around with anybody. We're stuffing around with fitness first. So anyway, long story short, they accepted me as a tenant. They, they were scared that I, because I was a fight promoter, that I was going to hold illegal fights in there. Oh, <laughs> so I had to sign. That's, as you'll know, that in Zoo Fitness, that I can't have a box. I don't have a boxing ring or a cage. And that was part of my lease and still is because they still think to this day that I'm going to hold illegal fights in there. Uh, like I want to go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> I like my ass the way it is. Um, so, yeah, man, that's that's how Zoo Fitness come about. And then... How long did that all take, like, that process? Uh, it took 12 months, probably. Yeah. yeah, 12 months. But then once... You still had Shogun then? Still yeah. had Shogun, yeah. So, but, I uh, look, the internet business is great, and financially it was really good for my family and a whole lot. But it's hard work. You know, I'm not, I don't read and write too well. So for me, replying to emails all day is so shit. I'd rather talk to you. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, someone used to come in the shop. I was like, yeah, yeah. Oh, hi, how are you? <laughs> hi, what are you doing? What do you need? A mouth guard? Okay. You know, so I was like that because, you know, the girls and that had everything sorted and we had rows and rows of 
stuff in warehouses where they just go around with shopping trolleys and pick the orders and pack them and send. Um, so, yeah, financial was really good, but it wasn't me. I'd, I really You're know. More of a people person, eh? Yeah. yeah, and I like talking to people. I like helping people. I still feel that what I do is not work. I just help someone to be the best person I can, you know. I don't help you do the push-up. I tell you how to do it. You know how to do it, you know. You're the one doing it. So I like helping people be the best version of themselves and I suppose that's probably been the winning formula for Zoo. At the end of the day, when you break it all down, I still like helping people. You know? I, I say to a lot of people, um, like if they want to go to a gym, I always recommend you guys. Like, I've only been going since I started doing that boxing stuff, but yeah. for a bigger facility, you guys have such a good culture there. It's yeah. not like a normal, like say, I don't want to bag Fitness no. First or other bigger gyms, yeah. but a bigger facility in our industry doesn't really have like a community feel or yeah, totally. it doesn't really have a culture like all your staff are friendly even yep. the members like yep. like i've done a couple of classes there um now and the people are willing to help you yeah. that you don't know yep. or you walk past someone just doing weights and they give you a nod yeah like it's very rare in a big facility they got that it, it is but um, do you reckon that filter di- filters down from just you like that it has to yeah be. that's the type that, like I'll, I'll lead the way on that that's me you know that's how i that's how, yeah and that culture that we built you know like if you don't part fit in that culture or you don't want to be part of that culture you you don't survive even our staff you know our staff are all like that and i think it just comes from the top down um yeah and that's it's easy when you do love what you do right it's it just easy. doesn't feel like work yeah. is that seems like going just speaking here now it's just been an evolution of that yeah. it's just like oh, i like doing this so yep. all these businesses are just sort of stuff. is there any other business that you've done outside of this industry um, or not really linked no, to it no? no not really no yeah. it's just all started from that um i'm about to do something else um i was a i was pretty close to doing another business before COVID and everything got done and there was so much work put into it, but um, COVID really uh, knocked us around for that. Um, but I've got a couple of other little things that I'm working on, but Zoo is such a juggernaut, it's hard to control, you know? like Because got, you got businesses within the business, is that right there? Like you got uh, a beauty salon and that? No, nah, that so gone? that's all gone, okay. uh, you know, but she used to lease space off us. Yeah. Uh, Cryo Fitness leases a, a room office, but that's it. Um, yeah. The rest is just all us. Okay. Because uh, you got yoga, like all classes, fight yeah. classes. Sixty two staff, man. Sixty two staff. Sixty two. Jesus. So you know, it, a lot happens there that behind the scenes that no one sees. You know, and that could be just a lady teaches karate, you know, twice a week to the kids, or it could be someone that's doing sixty hours. Yeah. You know. Um, but yeah, sixty two people depend to get paid at some capacity this week. Do you, from, from do you find that's um, the hardest part of being a business owner is the staff? What do you find the most difficult? Yeah, we're pretty lucky. We're pretty lucky. But, yeah, it seems to – our staff are good. And like I said, I built that co- culture. So it's very rare. We've got people that leave and come back to us, yeah. you know, because they think the grass is greener on the, the other side and whatever. Um, but they realise that it's, it's a good place to work. So we're pretty lucky with staff. I think um, – with this, like it, the fitness industry members can be your biggest headaches, right? You've got good members, you've got bad members, you've got members that don't pay and members, you know, like there's so many variables. Um, and I think members give us the biggest workout. Yeah. <laughs> you know, our staff is have a lot more members than what we would. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's different it's, dynamic. It is, totally, totally, totally. You know, um, but... And you got, I guess... <laughs> Because you do, like, you got boxing, Muay Thai, like, jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Then you got the normal gym. Then you got, like, a crossfit sort of section. Yeah, yeah. Yoga. So there's a lot of different... Les Mills. We've yeah, still got oh, body yeah, pump. Yeah. We've got yeah. body attack. And, you know... So you've got so many different yeah. types of members yeah. as well. Or, yeah, yeah. Like, they But just, they do mix. Yeah. They do mix well. Um, like, mine was always, like, as a fighter, like, if you could walk into Zoo Fitness, mate, this is the ultimate... Wow, look at this. You even got a sauna. Yeah. You know, like I used to have to go and spend Friday nights at Ripples, yeah. St Mary's. There was the only sauna this side of Sydney. <laughs> you know, like I sit in there with the jockeys because they're racing tomorrow and I'd sit there losing <laughs> weight. <laughs> you know, but um, yeah, it was uh, this, the facility is, is a dream. It's a really dream. If you, and uh, not just if you want to be a fighter or whatever, it's if you want to look after yourself, you're more than welcome. You know, and those types of people we've got. You know, we don't have the 
guys, you know, that they they come and go. That's not the not the gym for them, you know. Mm. We're real family orientated, and I feel that people at Penrith are real. They're still real, you know. Mum and dad work. You know, try and do the best for the kids. We'll take them to hockey or football or basketball training or whatever. But we always sacrifice time for the kid. We come last as parents, you know, and, and hard-working parents in this area. So my concept, even before I got bought the business off Fitness First, was what if, what if you could come to the gym, put your kid in a little martial arts program and go and hop on the treadmill for 30, 40 minutes and then come home and have Dad's dinner on the table at 6 o'clock still. Mate, how good would that be? You know, because we all get in these bad habits. We eat late at night because the kid had to go to netball training or blah, blah, blah. I'm like, man, that, that works. We're time poor. We work hard, but we're time poor. So that was the concept. And now I feel, yes, some people use it for that. Um, yes, a lot of people that use it for that. And we see it all the time. They take them to the karate class or take them to kick. The kids, the kids at our gym at, at 4 o'clock... Um, is, is amazing to watch. All the little kids run past, they give me high fives. And, you know, I just, for me, having a kid in the gym, like, I love it, you know. Is it, do you, do you think uh, this concept was, what like, started because of your upbringing as well? That was, like, totally. your ph- philosophy behind it? Totally. From what you went through? Yeah, yeah, you want to, I always want to nurture a kid, right? I wasn't, I was a kid that was far from nurtured. No one ever wanted me. <laughs> I was staying at friends' houses all the time, you know. Um, it was, it was, uh, yeah, it was tough. And I think I feel that if you can show a kid a little, how do I show a kid love? I give it martial arts. That's what I do, you know. I can't. I'm not going to build a wet and wild land or <laughs> wonderland. You know what I mean? I'm gonna. I know what I can do. I can give a kid martial arts, and that's a skill. I suppose when you learn to fight. And it's a skill that you have with you until the day you die. And these kids, some of these kids, I'm telling you, they're, they're some of those kids I'm watching those kids' classes, no one's taking their lunch money. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they really, really love their martial arts. And it puts a smile on my face, you know. And to see the parents drop her off and then quickly go and get exercise themselves or do a class or hot abs or yoga or go to a pump class, I'm like, yes, this is, this is what I wanted, you know. So you create yeah. another family. Yeah, know, totally. Good. And I think it's been – look, that's the type of gym that I wanted, you know what I mean? If you're in Penrith, I feel if you're in Penrith and you don't exercise, mate, you're a dumbass. That we are spoiled for quality coaches, quality gyms, you, you guys, yourself, the G3 boys, the, the Darren Pierre's, the any gym you want to go to, you know, is great. You know, they all earn their stripes in one way. You guys earn your stripes, you know, Luke and you know, they they've got the community, they've got their thing and you know, you'll have you, but your people gravitate to you, you know what I mean? And if you don't go and use the gyms in Penrith, I mean, I don't know, maybe you just use the pubs. <laughs> uh, you know, you're just, you're not really, you're spoiled for choice. Yeah, you know, that's that, 100%. I'd like, I actually put out a post this week about it saying like people go, oh, there's another gym open up. Like we got another one open up here about uh, Plus Fitness, I think. Just oh, are they? Where the old shoe shed used to be. Oh, someone said there's a machine plus, in there. Is it? Plus? Yeah, 24. I think it might be Plus. might be wrong, but I was like, good. Like, if you look, there's not enough gyms. And people yeah. are like, oh, it's competition. I'm like, it's not competition. There's that many people. Yeah. Like, that, but you guys will always survive. Yeah, because exactly. Your, pers- your personal Yeah, you've yeah. got your own little niche. Plus like, Fitness, they've got 800. I'll tell you who won't go, to go well in this town, right? Because like I said, every coach including yourself and those guys I just mentioned, earned their stripes. If you just bought a business, if you had a concrete business and you thought you'd build a great facility and because you like fitness or you don't, you don't like fitness, you like money. Yeah. But that hunger for money will, will expose you in this industry because people want real and we're spoilt by quality people. You know what I mean? So if you just bought a good little franchise and you think you're going to survive in this town... Good luck to you, because you're in for a fucking hard week, <laughs> a hard year. Yeah, it is Cause tough. Because there's too many quality people, you know? And uh, like even World Gym, right? So Claire, and that she's a quality coach, quality person. She knows, and she'll have her, her, her people. But if you just decided, oh, they sold me this great franchise, they're going to pay $800,000, they're going to fit it out, and the next thing you know, I'm going to start selling gym memberships. Good luck to you. 
you, you actually didn't do your homework too well. It's, yeah. e- it's easy entry like a gym, I guess. Like it's it's pretty easy to get it up yeah. and running. Yeah. But to be successful with it, I think that like long term, it's pretty, it's like you said, there's there's a lot around as well. And you see, how many in your time have you seen start oh, and on? Even oh, like, be... back at Shogun, right? So anytime fitness come out. So uh, I don't want to pigeonhole them, but a shitload of, Accountants, uh, a shitload of people that used to own 7-Elevens, a shitload of people that own Subway franchises weren't going too well, said, this is a new thing. We unstaff it, you open up the door and you do your thing. And I used to, again, replace their boxing bags and their swivels and all sorts of stuff. Um, And I used to see them come in. They're not gym owners, bro. (laughs) <laughs> They're not chimos. Some of these guys can't struggle to get out the front seat of their car. Oh, can you put a bag? It's a four-foot four, four foot bag, mate. You can't lift it. Oh, can you put it in the back of the car for me? Put it in the back of the car. There's KFC packets. and They're not gym people. They're financial people. So when financial people get invested in our industry, good luck to you. And that's what's happened with a couple of gyms in Penrith. Not mentioning no names. We all know who they are. But come. See how good you are. Because you've got... If you think that it's just a financial transaction, good luck. Good luck. <laughs> well, that's that, yeah, that, that thing that comes back, I think, that stands out for you guys is your community family feel. And that's yep. why, that's how you're successful, really. Yep. Yep. And uh, I guess the way you judge, ju- uh, judge success, like you're like, I'm helping someone's family, I'm helping this kid. Yep. It's not just the dollars that come in. That's Money that, comes and goes, yeah. man. We've had good times, we've had bad times, you know, but money comes and goes. But how, how, you, how well you sleep at night, that's success. And I know I, I've helped uh, so many people in this community. Um, you know, some I don't talk to anymore. Some of you will hear bad shit stories about me or whatever. But I'm telling you, when I pass them and when I walk with my head held high anywhere in this town, and I can do that, um, that makes me proud, you know, that I never fucked anyone over, you know, and that's... To get where I am, all we've done is work hard. You know, we all know bad fellas that you could have borrowed money off to go and, but I didn't. I, I had to go and put my tail between my legs and ask my father in law, can he put his house up for my first business? I had mates that probably had that money buried in the backyard, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I didn't. And I don't, I'm so glad that I, you know, I didn't go down that road, but um, I can hold my head up high, anyone, you know, so that's. So what's next for you? You mentioned a couple of, do you uh, want to share or not? Um, mate, I'm, I'm touching on the whole, the recovery system of my nervous system through, uh, so recovery is my thing at the moment. I'm really deep into it. Because of what you went through? Yeah. And I see the gap. I say this, unless you're the 25 people in, there's only 25 people in Penrith that get looked after as far as I'm concerned. And that's the top 25 Penrith NRL. Because we all can train like animals. We all got that app. You got coaches like yourself, but our biggest gap, I feel, you watch your favourite Instagrammer. He can train like a beast, but he never shows you his recovery. He might go, here, take this protein powder. It's all bullshit, he got paid to do it, right? We know that. So the gap, I feel, is recovery. So my next thing is all about recovery. Um, And, you know, maybe a recovery centre that we build where, you know, that's on the cards. Um, But a little bit touching on the CBD oil, um, no, I don't know enough about it, but I met some really interesting people. Um, it won't be long till all that stuff's here, like fully legalised and yeah. all that. Yeah, I think the hemp side of things, look, it's CBD oil, it's illegal already. Mm. The transition, like I met a farmer. Oh, it's legal here, is it? Yeah, it's legal. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. I it was still illegal. No, because there's no CH- THC in it. Okay. So it's only just the hemp oil. Yeah, right. So, yeah, you, you can smoke the whole pl- whole farm. You, can't, you don't get high. <laughs> yeah, there's no there's no psycho element to it. Yeah. So that's the strain of the seed that they, they plant. It's only just for the oil. Now, they talk about curing cancer and all sorts of stuff that needs the THC to activate. Yeah, to okay, help. that's the stuff I'm that's thinking stuff about. That, yeah. yeah, but this is like recovery, nervous system, sleep. And we, when you get better sleep, you know that your REM is when your body heals. And so there's so much benefit. So I'm only just learning, but um, yeah, look out for that. That's uh, You'll have a zoo recovery uh, at some stage. That's Light the, up a doobie in there as well, huh? Yeah, well, <laughs> that's not my thing either, you know, but I've travelled to, uh, to LA a lot and it yeah. seems to be just pretty normal. You know, my kids walk around the street and go, Dad, what's that smell? Like, <laughs> you know, and, you know, um, 
that I don't think I'm into that side of it. I'm not yeah. a dispensary type dude. It's I don't want that. I'm all a, all about the recovery because I there's a missing part to anyone being fitness or and that's just oh yeah you watch you train like a beast but that how's he do it the next day like what is he doing like there's there's a gap there's a gap and you can buy the someone's program you can buy some girl's program there uh, you know Kayla Insteins or whatever and you can do this program for mate, after day three and like I can't even move right <laughs> so but they don't show you the recovery part of it and I think that is the next part for the health and fitness industry you know yeah. um so that's that's what's got me ticking. A lot of a lot of people too don't realise that you don't get your gains when you're training. It's actually your recovery <laughs> part. That's where you, well, yeah, yeah, you rip, rip and tear when you train. Yeah, exactly. You need to recover. And what do you do when you recover? You know, you don't go out with your mates dirt bike riding. And <laughs> you, you know, like that doesn't help your recovery. So, um, yeah, I'm interested in that. I'm yeah. interested. It's ticking, making my brain tick at the moment. My so. mate's got a. Uh, place down in Caring Bar, La Cure Wellness, him yep. and Damien Cook. Mm-hmm. I'm actually going to see him this week. And yep. they've got a recovery centre. They opened, I think it was last year, maybe about 12 months old. Yep. And it is chock-a-block every Mate. single day. Yeah, it's it's the next thing. And they've got a bit of everything too. They yep. do all these laser, cryo, like the Norma- boots. Normatex. Yeah, and, the, yeah. Um, even Game the like, IVs and all that stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's that's... That's where we would love to go, um, yeah. and I've got a couple of partners involved with it. And um, but like I said, we were pretty much ready to go, and then COVID hit, and we'd done all the research. I've got uh, you know one of the guys there is an amazing um, uh, numbers guy, so he's crunched a heap of numbers, and like I've got all that data, we've got everything ready to go, and um, like the COVID hit and just sort of threw it out the window. But um, I think it's still going to happen for us. So that's it's, that's the plan. Um, It'll be good, man. Look forward mm. to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've done some work. We've done some What's work. What's it going to call? Zoo recovery? No, no, no. <laughs> we're not. We didn't even get that far, I don't think. But, um, you know, like full ice baths, like full bath and then different, like four pools. Yeah. Plunge pools. Yeah, nice. And, and uh, you know, hots and cold therapies and, you know, yeah, float tanks and stuff. But, yeah, that's on the cards and uh, we'll see what happens. But I think the gap is so <sighs> just... It's just not there, you know. Apart from taking this protein shake, like I said, the top 25 guys in Penrith are the only ones that get to access it. And Some decent recovery. Yeah, and we got so many great athletes. Our CrossFit guys and, uh, you know, um, our martial arts guys, our boxers, our, you guys are trained here. Um, the netballers, our, our local footy, footy guys, the, you know, they just don't get to recover like those top 25 in the NRL. And mm-hmm. we've all been over there. We've seen their facility and what they do and how they come off the field and the, the supplements they've got to take and the massages they get. And that's why they can perform week in, week out, you know. Um, but, yeah, so so that's that's had me ticking for the probably last 12 months um, pretty seriously, the, the recovery centre, you know. Yeah, it'll be good. Mm. I hope you do get it off the yeah, ground. Yeah, 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 yeah. We do. What's up for you guys? What, what's I mean, the first time here. Um. First time here, yeah. So we're we're planning on expanding, and yep. obviously COVID's come through again. Yeah. Um. So, like, we're still going to expand, and we're actually looking at doing some online stuff. And then yep. the whole industry went there, so yeah. we, we try to fast track what we're going to do. And we, me and Luke just realised we fucking hated it. Like, yeah. we're the same as you. Yeah. We love being like, like it's our members, being with our members, yeah. or whether it be so we expand, where we feel like yeah, our, our people, um, you know, helping them grow their yeah. own businesses, and yeah. So we we love that face to face community. Like people always talk, oh, technology is going to come in and yeah. you know ruin our industry. People will never, I reckon, fully go online. It's no. that face to face is yeah. what people. Miss, they love community. Yeah, we're being a part of something. Like, yeah. So, yeah, we'll, we're definitely going to be expanding. Like, we're yep. speaking of Matty Gamble, we jumped on the potty and we're yep. talking about it. And yep. like, there's people like, oh, not another gym. Like I said before, there's fuck, there's not enough. How many unhealthy people are there? Or <laughs> yeah. Like, and, and if you believe in yourself, yeah, and you believe in your product, that's all you need to do, right? Yeah. And you got to be good. I think. I think, like I said, come to this town and you'll get exposed if you just did it for money. Or you really want to help people, because then you know it comes out. Like yeah. I said, you, people can look at you and tell you, you know, can tell whether what you're about. 
you know, that's there's there's our industry is not flawed like that. You need to be, have a face, you know, and I think yeah. like having a face in the gym. Someone said to me, uh, you know, about Zoo. He goes, you know what, Zoo's the only place where the gym owner is in, like big commercial gyms. You know, yeah. the owner is here. I can yeah, come that's in. That's true. I couldn't. I wouldn't remember a face of any big. No. Gym. So that was a winning formula. Like I've. I, people know where my office is, right? I've got old ladies and they'll come and say, Jason, there's a bolt missing here or a bolt on loose and I'll go out to a machine and I'm like, look, and I, and I, then I start and tighten it up and I look up and she, she's sitting there <laughs> smiling, you know. Um, this is the type of members that we've got, you know. They just they know that they can come to me and Tracy and, and they can get an answer from the owner, yeah. you know. Um, I think World Gym now that that Claire's taken over. She's got that face-to-face person now as well as a big commercial gym. But apart from that, you haven't. Yeah. Atmosphere, the owner's not there. He's at his concrete plant. He's got no say in it. He pays wages. Um, anytime fitness. Uh, UFC gym, not the owner there. Or the owner, you, know, you know, so there's any... Who else is there, there? What are the other big players now? I, I don't know. I, I don't really keep track on it now because I, I just don't care. I'm so focused on what we're doing. I wasted used to. A, wasted energy, but isn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah. I've wasted some energy. Yeah. I've wasted some energy. But I just learned to know, I believe in the system we've got. I believe that we have got amazing coaches and I believe in them. And like I said, the culture that we created. So I'm happy with everything we've done. Yeah. You know? And yeah. if you're not getting value for $13 a week, I can't help you there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's all, it's what you said um, about... It doesn't feel like work. And that's what, like, Luke and myself and business yeah. partner, we'll, we're just like, yeah, we love helping our members, but, like, the next thing for us is we want to help people but have our business like we've had. Yeah. So, like, that's our that's our philosophy on expanding. Yeah, we obviously want to make money like everyone else. Got to eat. But, like, imagine, like, like you said, imagine teaching someone, all right, this is what you can do for work. Like, yeah, what yeah. a good feeling. Not just oh. for your members but for your staff. Or, yeah. So, yeah, that's... Yeah, you know, like like I said, man, your your club, do fitness club, gym, whatever you call it, facility yeah. is unreal. Like it's thank you, thank you. Um, I love going down there and training down there. Yeah, it's a good joint, and yeah. I know a lot of people in Penrith do. Yeah, as well. So yeah. when I can, I explain it. We're pretty normal, hey. There's normal characters. Yeah, it's just there's no egos or anything yeah. like that. It's yeah. everyone just seems like they're on the same field, you know, which is yeah. very rare again. It's like so rare because we have so many different diversity places within the gym. We've got yeah. people doing yoga and they just care about their Zen time. Yogis. We've got people, other people choking each other out and doing jujitsu. <laughs> so like you know. Um, let me tell you, the yoga instructors are easier to deal with than the jiu-jitsu instructors. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, nothing to worry to them. Uh, but, yeah, someone said, uh, one of the fighters originally, when I first went over there, the boxing bags used to be out the front of the martial arts rooms, and we built this boxing bag rack to hold it. Anyway, um, one of the fighters, or ex-fighter, he was there. He's like, oh, are you going to put a wall up here? And I go, what for? And he goes, oh, so the guys in the weights don't look at us. I go, look at you, what? I just punch in and kick in a bag. I feel like, you know, they're going to look at us. And I went, I kind of questioned myself. I, I didn't have a problem with it. I'm like, what? What? They're just on the... Anyway, that was his, his issue, right? And I went, oh, shit, maybe... Oh, hang on. Maybe, yeah, they might not like each other, right? And that was on my, my head for a little bit. Just his comment, you know. And then about a month later, I was walking down the green that sled track the big sled track we got and i seen a young fighter talking to a big guy on a waste machine and i walked past and i said oh hey how's he's going you're good anyway they were talking about nutrition and i walked away from that conversation going you know what everyone's on the same path mm -hmm. they're just looking after himself this guy chooses weights to do this guy chooses martial arts mm -hmm. so we're all the same this guy wants to, we just want to live longer right and be healthy and look good and feel good so yeah it's that's what when you put that wall up, it just straight away puts a divide, doesn't it? 100%. Yeah. United we stand, divided we fall. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> Boy, it's a good quote from yeah. the plea. Yeah, so. So what, like, what advice would you, I ask all, all the guys that jump on here, guys yes. and girls that jump on, what advice would you give to someone to go out and just have a go? Um, like, you have to, or from our convo, like, I've learned a lot off you today, where you've come yeah. from, and you can see exactly why you've been successful, because you've just had a fucking crack, really. Yeah. You just kept it. having a go. So what yeah. advice would you give someone? It's totally self-belief. If you believe in something good enough, unless you're just, you know, there's going to be some special crystals that are going to make you look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> it doesn't matter, mate, if you want to mow lawns or whatever, if you self-believe I'm going to be the best fucking lawnmower in town, 
And if you believe it and you have passion for what you do, the money will come. So don't worry about money, because money's the worst. It don't, can't rule your life. We've all got that mate who worries about money. You go out with him and he's, you know, oh, sorry, I didn't need any spring rolls, so can you take that off the bill, right? But we just don't, don't worry about money. Money comes and goes, but if you're passionate enough, whatever it is, I don't care what, if you want to be the best mechanic in the, in the town or you, whatever you want to do, if your passion will come through and eventually I feel your passion, unless you're too much of a nice guy, will turn into financial gain for you, you know? All right. Yeah. Awesome, Lapo. No worries. That was, that was, fuck, that was, a good, that was good, man. I really enjoyed oh, that. I'm glad eh? you enjoyed it. I, 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 it's, I suppose you get to um, understand who I am. Yeah, you know, like oh, this is probably a, I've only ever said sort of g'day and that talked yeah. a little bit about training or whatever, but yeah. you know, just seeing your story is pretty inspirational, man. Yeah. Like, you can go, but I, I say it's in my DNA. My I'm a my grandparents are a Russian Jew, so they escaped the Holocaust. Oh yeah, yeah. So my grandparents got cold shivers again. So here they uh, that there was obviously Jew, Jews in 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 Russia. Um, and then so they escaped to China, uh, to Japan, got to Japan, hopped on a boat. But they were so scared of being Jews, they chucked all the... My name shouldn't, my surname shouldn't be Lappin, it should be like Kilkoski or something. Yeah, so, but they were so scared of being Jews because they seen what happened yeah, okay. to the, the country. Um, they, oh no, we're not Jews. And they got here and they just took on this name Lappin uh, on the boat that they landed in Sydney. So they survived. They're, you know, um, yeah, they survived and got out of the country. And I feel that that's in my DNA, you know, survival. So. Well, it seems like that's what you've been doing, gone through a bit, so. Yeah. I think everyone's got a story, right? Yeah. Everyone, everyone's, and that's somebody, the and beauty of doing these podcasts, pod, podcasts, potties, <laughs> podcasts. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's exactly what you said. It's like everyone's story. Like, yeah. You everyone. can take away something from that. Of course yours. you can. Of course you've you got can. a lot. Yeah. Resilient. Yeah. Mother that's survival. Are, <laughs> yeah. Sure. But, yeah, man, that's... Like I said, unreal, but like a lot of people get a lot of out. I'm pretty sure half your gym will listen to it. So. Yeah, so hopefully they do, and I suppose they get to know Coming the in and give real you a big inside. Hug, mate. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, look, I don't need it, man. I, you know, I, I do appreciate it, and uh, I wear my uh, heart on my chest and sleeve, and I'm, and you know, I'm not scared of hard work and not scared of taking a risk. And like I said, I lost the thing that's most dearest to me at ten years old. So. Well, you're doing good now. Yeah, you're, doing, you're helping yeah. a lot of people in the area. Yeah. So, yeah. Yep. thanks for jumping on. Appreciate no worries. It. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it and a uh, bit more of a story about Lapo, I suppose. Lapo. Thank you. To be continued. <laughs> <laughs>